I thought it was lacking, lacking something. Well, at this time of year, it's difficult to avoid. At this time of year, you go along a street and outside some people's houses, they'll have funny things. They might have a, a skeleton. They might have witch's hat, cobwebs stretched, as it were, or fake cobwebs stretched all over the windows of the, the whole garden sometimes. You go into the shops, and it's all for sale there. You can buy as much of this stuff as you want. Sometimes the whole aisles are taken up with it. Halloween merchandise. Hard to avoid at this time of year. And we might ask the question, why not celebrate Halloween? Why not? Everyone else is. And so particularly want to address this today, a couple of weeks ahead of Halloween, it's the 13th, I and mean, if you turn the numbers around the other way, it's the 31st, which is when Halloween actually is. But people's brains are now wired to think about it at this time of year, in our culture, in our secular culture. You know, I was thinking, that, you know, we each have our autumn festivals, and they both begin with the letter H. We had ours last week, didn't we? Harvest. Yeah? But the world has Halloween. We have harvest. We celebrate, especially celebrate the goodness of God and his future plans. But the world has Halloween. The world has Halloween. And what is Halloween really? It is making fun of things that scare us. We might make fun of death make fun of things that perhaps we don't know too much about. You know, the word occult means unknown. And so for some, it has a particular fascination. Some might just dabble on the outside. But lots of people, they'll say, Halloween, it's just almost like a cartoon. It's not really real. It's just dabbling with something on the outside. Not really jumping into the reality. But these are dark realities. These are dark things. Demons are real. Witches are real. Death is real. And we don't really have any need of joking about these things, of making light of them. And so we're really answering this question, how can Halloween be harmful? You might ask that as a, how can Halloween be harmful? Everybody else is doing it. It's just an ordinary, it's just like, you know, Christmas giving presents or whatever. Or I just put up skeletons outside my house. It's just no big deal. Will I have Father Christmas or a skeleton? You know, it's just a different way to dress my house. Is that it? Is that it? Well, when we look at the Bible, which should be our guide for everything, for all our thinking and doing, we look at the Bible, we read that we're made by God for God. And so when it comes to these things of death and demons and witches and witchcraft, look at what Jesus' attitude was. We had two readings this morning, didn't we? Two readings, Mark chapter 5 and Mark chapter 9. And what happened in the first one? This person who others pushed away to the outside, outer limits of society, no, not living anywhere near the towns or villages. No, this man lived in the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. He lived away from other people, nothing to do with others. That was out of harm's way. That's where they wanted him, as it were. But Jesus didn't want this man suffering. 
Jesus wanted this man to be taken out of his horrific situation, occupied by a legion of demons. The demons actually were put into these pigs that were nearby. You can go into the ins and outs of that at a later time, but the the red letter stuff, the, the loud headline you want, I want you to hear is that Jesus hated demons. And Jesus was here to deliver people from demon possession. And so he threw out the demons of the man. And at the end of the reading that we had, we ended it at verse 15. And there we are with the man sitting, dressed, no longer naked, dressed and in his right mind. And they're afraid. They're afraid because Jesus can do what they can't. It's almost as if they preferred the man when he was very much at arm's length, but still demon-possessed. They didn't care for his soul. But Jesus did. Jesus did care. And that's why he came. He came to bring his peace, his presence into us. And the same is true for the other account that we had read to us in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, there's a boy there whose father has brought to Jesus. And it says that, uh, I, I teach you, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth. It becomes rigid. Do you want that in your life? Do you want that in somebody else around you's life? No, we don't want that. And that's why this man came to Jesus, his own son who he loves. And Jesus came to deal with such issues. Now, I've got some visuals, visual aids, and I want you to um, be helped by these things. Um, these are simple pictures to help us understand spiritual realities. So I'm just going to put some, these represent people here on the board, and uh, it's going to put them in there. They're colourful characters, aren't they? Uh, blue and yellow, green, orange, uh, and red. And these just represent uh, ordinary people. People you might mix with in the world. Neighbours, relatives, friends, people who don't actually yet love the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the first thing you might throw back at me or some Christian who comes up and gives you a hard time if you're celebrating Halloween and you're going along with everybody else, you might just say, but we don't want to be seen as different. We don't want to be seen as different. You know, these people look to be colourful and interesting. And there I am, you know, they look interesting, but we are different. What shape are they? They're all square and we're round. Yeah, so that's, we're just different anyway. If we've come to Christ, we're now different in nature. We have to get this into our heads. We have to understand that as we walk through this world, we might look, obviously non-Christians don't actually look square, we don't actually look round, but we have to think of this way um, because they are lacking something that we don't have. In fact, we need to be remade, don't we? You can't, you can't literally uh, change that into that because this one is white and pure. And of course, in God's sight, we are. In God's sight, when we trust in the Lord Jesus, we're covered by the, uh, his righteousness, what he did on the cross exchanged our rags and filth of our sin for his righteousness. That's the truth that comes through in the Bible. So we might say, I don't want to be seen as different, but we are different. What has Jesus called us to? We've already looked at uh, of, of two of those passages there where we see what Jesus came to do, but then what did he actually call us out 
to do. It's on the same opening as Mark chapter eight. It's Mark chapter uh, sorry, Mark chapter nine. It's in Mark chapter eight. <laughs> Mark chapter 8 uh, and verse 34, page 10, 12, 1, 0, 1, 2. Uh, it says that he called uh, the crowd to him along with his disciples and he said, if anyone would come after me. So some might see his disciples there because Jesus, I guess, is a, a fair way into his, his public ministry here. And they, and they see him going around with this, this smaller group who are obviously very important to him and he wants to teach them particularly and hand his work over to them in whatever time of course they don't know that after his crucifixion that's going to come up uh, that his teaching ministry is only going to be three years long but he gathers a crowd to him as well as his disciples and he says if anyone would come after me He's saying what discipleship really looks like. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, in Roman times, if you carried a cross, that meant that you were going to die on it. Jesus here is saying, if anyone come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And so it's obvious that that person who's going to their death is carrying the cross. And in the same kind of way, as Christians, it's obvious that we have died to our self, died to our old way of life. And now we are completely sold out for Jesus and the new way of living that he has called us into. But we understand that demons and witches and, and obviously the spectre of death is, is very real. But we don't make fun of it. We don't make light of it. We don't make sport of it. We don't turn it into a season of, of celebrating or joking about these things. No. We see dark things at work in the world and we want Jesus. And Jesus to be the name on everyone's lips. Jesus the victor. Jesus the one who pulls us out, who rescues us and translates us, transfers us from the kingdom of darkness into his kingdom of light. Matthew 6, verse 24. You needn't turn to it. It's here we read it. Matthew 6, 24. We read this. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Uh, in this instance, he said, you cannot serve both God and money. God and mammon, the, the, the stuff the world runs after, craves. You can't do that, he says. But that's the point. We need to serve God. King Jesus. He's made us a difference. If we are already in Christ, if we've understood the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, and we say yes to him, yes to him being our King and Saviour. And I'm just going over to one of Paul's letters, and this is Philippians 2. And it says there, do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation, in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. <coughs> Got a question for you. How different are stars to the dark space they inhabit. Can you see any difference at all? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Well, we can see them from all this distance away, so it's pretty obvious they are shining very brightly indeed. They're very different to their surroundings. There is the Lord telling us we, as Christians, as those who trust in the Lord Jesus, are to be 
ones who shine out like stars in the universe. Think of how far those stars are away and how brightly they shine. That's a picture, God tells us, of you and me and how we are to be as Christians, shining like stars in the dark universe. Wow. That's what God has called us to. So if we come back with that, we don't want to be seen as different. Well, we are different. So be different. Not different weird, different stupid, different whatever. No, different good. Shining like stars. Star, stars give light, don't they? Always doing good things for the good of God's world, universe. And so should we. We need to be seen as different. I've only got two points today. You might be relieved of it. <laughs> two points. So the first excuse as to why we don't get involved in Halloween is we don't want to be seen as different. And the second one is this. We don't want to miss out. We don't want to miss out. I've got another little bit of my visual aid here. We don't want to miss out. And I would say, miss out on what exactly? Miss out on what? If we're the Lord's people, it means we won't simply jump in thoughtlessly into anything and everything, whatever anybody else is doing. Because really, we, this needs to be turned on itself. People are saying, why aren't you in here with us? But actually, it's the other way around. It's as if they are trapped in the bubble. And we have everything else. But they're just in that little place there. But we have all that God has made that is good. I'm going to turn to 1 John 1. Verse 1 to 9. As I said uh, before, these are just very simple pictures to help us understand spiritual realities. But I hope you keep this illustration in your head for a long time. That's my intention. These are simple pictures to help us understand spiritual realities. 1 John 1, verse 1, that's page 1225 using a church Bible. And there, John writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. That's Jesus, capital W there. The life appeared, we have seen it, and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and, and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. See that there? It's not saying, oh, we keep it to ourselves, we're a special bunch, you know. We want it to be them and us. We want to be privileged and you not to know. No, he says we are sharing with everyone because we want everyone to know this quality of life, to be not stuck in the bubble, but actually enjoying God's provision and life everywhere outside of it. So he says, and our fellowship. We proclaim to you what we've seen and heard that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy, and your joy, complete. This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him 
and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all and every sin. Glorious truths, aren't they? Wonderful. Hallelujah. I want to smile on every face as I read those words. Because if you're a Christian, that includes you. It should make you come alive. If it doesn't, I doubt your salvation. Sorry, but I do. Yeah? Purifies, we should be, yeah, throwing a punch. Is it punching the answer? Yes, that's my saviour. He has, by his sacrifice on the cross, covered my every sin. And it's all, all about him because he gave his all for us. If we claim to be without sin, we're above, we say we're above all this. Well, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. And will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. In some ways, he, he's more than just, isn't he? If he was just, he would just condemn us and say, well, you chose to walk away from me. You chose to sin against me. But I'm offering you forgiveness. But he's just in that he is keeping to his own promise. His own promise that he will forgive anyone who trusts in him. When you reach out and claim that promise for yourself, you say, yes, that's mine. I want that. That's the best offer I'll ever have. You go for it. Yeah. You grab hold of it because he is faithful. And everyone who grasps that promise, everyone who, who holds on to him, who, who reaches out for him, he will save. Yes. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Yeah. The Bible's claim is that everyone who doesn't yet trust in Christ is really is suffocating in, in a bubble, if you like. Worldliness is the bubble which keeps us from recognizing our real situation. Until the Lord Jesus rescues us and releases us into the greatness of his, and, and the wonder of his beauty and glory. This is what I said about, you know, we think of, they will say, why aren't you jumping in with us in the world, the world system? You're outside. And we say, yeah, but you're, you're, tra you're trapped in there. And we've got all the rest of what God has made, his, his safe pasture. We've got, we've got the reality of his presence. We've got the glory, the beauty of his majesty. We know what true life is. That's what John is saying here in his gospel and in his letters. So the worldly way of thinking inside the Bible actually keeps them. Those who are still not yet believers, it keeps them from the freedom of Christ that we were all created to know. This board's not big enough, by the way. <laughs> it needs to be <laughs> expanding out infinitely. Yeah. You get the picture, I hope. And those trapped inside the world's bubble will always need new things to make life Exciting, I said at the beginning, well, they're colourful characters. They might, they might they look quite interesting. You know, we might read some biographies or find things online or on television about, oh, these people did this. Oh, I didn't know that. That person's very, very, very it's very interesting. But uh, as I uh, said to somebody a few years ago, don't let what's merely interesting distract you from what's really important. Yeah. And so they might have a, what looks to be a fun old time in the world here. But don't be fooled. They will always need new things to make life exciting, to give some sort of purpose to their existence. But those who have life in Christ, I mean, I've done this as a, as a separate person out here. You might think, oh, they must be a bit lonely. But of course, this person, A, has God himself anyway, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then, of course, has fellowship as we've just seen in 1 John 1, fellowship with every other believer, which is the wonderful 
wonderful blessing of being in Christ, fellowship with everyone else. Those who have life in Christ, they know their true purpose and have fellowship with God and so have peace. These priceless things, things that money can't buy, things that hard work cannot earn. They have freedom. Everyone in Christ has true freedom. They have assurance, not unsettled by bad news. And those foretelling of a grim future of the earth's population, they have assurance of Jesus having all things under his control. Jesus coming again as Saviour and Lord, as our ultimate rescuer and the one who will bring us into his glorious presence. So I hope, having said all that, it doesn't just answer Halloween, but it might answer lots of different things in your life from now on. Yeah. And see, it's not about the missing out. It's not about, oh, do I have to be different? But he's made us different. We are to be different for him, for his sake. And missing out on what? It's the other way round. It's those who are still worldly, who are still taken up by things of the world, who are missing out on all the glories that God wants to lead us into in his kingdom. Let's pray together. Father God, we praise you for you, the greatness of your salvation. Uh, Father, mere words alone cannot contain how wonderful you are. Uh, what you have given us. But, but Lord, uh, when we come to accept you, we take you at your word, we read uh, what is, uh, yes, words on a page, but we read in the word and we believe in our hearts that, that they're infused with your Holy Spirit, that, 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 that they're empowered. This is your unique word. It's not like the Shakespeare, works of Shakespeare. It's not like uh, some uh, other author. These are venerated words and they do some good. But Lord, these are life-changing. That your spirit wrote them in the first place. And that your spirit accompanies your word. And therefore, they can do a wonderful, wonderful work in our lives. And Father, we trust you. We take you at your word and we want these things to change us. And we want to enjoy living with you in your kingdom. And we pray for those who are still trapped inside the world system, uh, that, Lord, you'd have mercy uh, on them. And, Lord, release them, that they might be brought into your kingdom of light, of peace, of assurance, and of joy. Please, Lord, give us the joy of knowing you. Help us to wake up and realise uh, how good it is that we are yours. And let us serve you all our days. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.